I'm so excited to be here and kick off the fourth annual Customer Success Summit. This is the fourth time that we're doing this, and this year it's even bigger than ever before. This was the first ever Customer Success event that we kicked off uh, three, four years ago. And this event is 15 times bigger than the first one. That's a personal joy, personal pride to see all that. Last year, when I uh, was giving my keynote speak, uh, there was a fire alarm. So this year, I'm prepared. I have a short keynote and a shorter keynote in case you <laughs> will need to be outside and uh, you know, drinking your coffee outside. So this is exciting. Customer success, you know, it's a thing now. It's growing very, very fast. You can see this is just Google Trends of customer success and see this spike in the last few years alone. This is really, really exciting. And we can also see the amazing uh, uh, trend of customer success by just looking at this, this event, right? You can see this year we have over 1,500 people here and there are some seats in the front, so the ones that are uh, standing at the back, but 1,500 people here I know that we are broadcasting on the, live, uh, on the live stream, so hello for everyone that are watching us uh, remotely. And um, as I said before, 15 times bigger than the first event, two times bigger than last year's event, which was our previous record, so that's really exciting. So customer success um, is picking up, and it's not as young as it used to be a year ago. Right? It's not as, as uh, mature as sales and marketing that have been around for decades or centuries. Uh, but for me, that's the, my eighth year in customer success since we started the Tango in 2010. And we are here uh, to share a lot of experiences about the learnings of customer success. So sharing experiences, we have this uh, summit and we have the keynotes, we have the breakout sessions, and a lot of many good people here in the audience that have been practicing customer success for the last few years and have experiences, and feel free to take advantage of all the opportunities to share your experience and learn and get something back to your companies when you come back on, uh, on Wednesday. I've been busy this year um, to share my experience as well. I've written this book called Farm Don't Hunt, and today I'm very proud to launch the book. And this is the book that uh, I was writing by attempting to provide the framework and best practices for customer success uh, organizations. When I started running engineering and uh, like looked like previous life, uh, I needed something that is going to guide me through how to get started, right? What is the model of, of running a good engineering um, organization? So there was a book, it was the Scrum book, the Radio Green, if you are familiar with, that I've read and helped me, I think, do a good job at, at, at doing that. And this is my attempt for the customer success community, for the practical guide for the customer success leaders. And I'm going to share some of the highlights from the book with you today. Um, the good news is for all of you are here, that are here, this book is going to be available for you. So just, you know, this is a, a complimentary thanks to Kaiser and to Tango Marketing team. And they're going to share this with you. So feel free to take a copy. And we're going to have a signing options as well. So happy to share this with you. For those of you who are remote, you can get the book um, on the online bookstores. So... What is, it, what is it about? What I've learned is that there are three major uh, decisions that companies that are implementing, uh, transitioning into the customer success model that have figured out. And I want to share those three main decisions that they've made with you today. So the first one, unlike sales, customer success is about farming, right? I, I don't know why it took me seven years to go full circle to my childhood. I was born in a farm. I grew up orange trees. Um, I guess it's because I was waking up 3 a.m. in the morning to work with my dad, so maybe this is something that uh, made it a little bit more difficult for me, but 
point I'm trying to make is customer success is about farming. And let me tell you why. When we think about our customers, when they, when they start, they're new customers, right? And the goal is uh, like, a, like a young tree to take root. Then it's a growing tree, right? It's a, you know, it's, there's no fruit anymore. And then there's this harvest, harvesting season. And in harvesting, we, we take the fruit. This is our yield. This is our profit. And it goes back into growing again. Right? New, growing, and in harvesting. And uh, what's interesting about this model, as opposed to pipeline model or sales model, is the recurring nature of it. We don't plant a tree for a single season. We plant a tree for multiple seasons. So our optimization, what we're trying to accomplish, is to maximize the yield over time. And by realizing that, very simple, very easy to understand, we understand that the model is a little bit different. And if we realize that this is the journey that our customers are going through, then it also determines the activities that we do as a customer success uh, organization. Where the metaphor breaks a little bit is that the renewal decision, upsell decision, cancellation, cancellation decision is people make those decisions. So the question becomes, how do we proactively impact the customer lifetime value? How do we proactively um, make sure that customer will eventually renew and grow versus cancel? And the other part, which is very, very uh, important, is that we need to look at drivers and outcomes. Drivers are the things that we can influence and will determine the outcome. So we can influence onboarding new customers, we can influence nurturing growing customers, and by that we will influence the outcome. And this kind of brings us a quick flashback into two years ago. We talked about, uh, in, the in the second Customer Success Summit, we've introduced the concept of the Customer Success Manifesto. The first point was value over customer management, right? So the key is to make sure customers are getting value from the ser online service or whatever service you deliver to them so they will make the decision to uh, renew and grow. So that's the first point that companies that have transitioned into customer success have realized. The second point that companies have realized is that customer success is a business, and there's a business model behind it. It is not about customer love. We all want our customers to love us, and we love all our customers, but that's not the point. The point is to optimize the customer lifetime value, and by being able to plan, forecast, track, and report on our ability to grow our recurring revenue business, we make the right decision. Let's talk about the business model for a quick second. So if we are trying to optimize lifetime value, let's understand lifetime value for a second. So if you look at an annual model of a customer, assuming a customer is paying us $10,000 a year, and the cost of serving this customer is, let's say, 30%, so our gross margin is $7,000. Out of that, we, uh, we are, there's a concept called customer retention cost, which is the cost that you know, our teams our systems, our technology, everything that we spend in order to retain this customer or grow it. This is the customer retention cost. So overall, as you can see here, and then this example is 5,500, this is the profit that we make on a per customer basis. And in this model, the per customer is what really matters. So if we kind of run it through the years, the first two years of this customer, we're actually not making a lot or we are under because we need to pay back for the customer acquisition cost. And only later in future years, let's assume 20% uh, churn, which means that on average the customer is with us for five years, we make some profit, in this case 17.5. And if the churn rate is 10%, we make a little bit more uh, profit, even way more, 45K. So the point being is that what we do and how does it connect churn, uh, being able to grow the customer upsell, is being incurred over several years. That's our goal. I know that this could be a little bit too confusing in this early morning. So if there's one thing you need to remember, 
The second thing that companies that have transformed into customer success did is they looked at customer success as a business. So now the question becomes, so how do we do it? How do we proactively impact customer lifetime value? And let's start with how we don't do it. So there are three things that you know, are obvious that customer success is not. Customer success is not support. I think I don't need to talk a lot about that. It's not about managing tickets. It's not about uh, uh, being reactive. It's about being proactive. So it's not support. It's also not project management. Right? I know that a lot of us think that onboarding is, is a project, so it, you know, maybe that's the right model. We need to run projects. And it's true, onboarding is some sort of a project, but it's not, what do we do later on when the customer is growing? We need to nurture them. That's not the typical project. And it's also not an exercise of pipeline management. Many companies early days, uh, especially with leaders coming from sales, looked at renewal dates, subtracted 45 days or 90 days, and looked at that as a pipeline. Right? That's our pipeline for renewal. Let's run and manage the pipeline. But you know what the challenge is. The problem is that by that time, it's too late. If the customer has already made a decision to leave, they're going to leave. Right? So we were unable to impact the lifetime value. Let me give you kind of a quick example around that. When we started the Tango, so we were still in Tel Aviv. And, we, and I partnered with my, one of my friends to use their marketing software. So we used it. And then I've hired my first marketing leader here in Silicon Valley, and she decided to use a different uh, system. So she uh, subscribed to a, a new marketing system. And this was six months into the first contract. And my friend and his company were very surprised and very upset to learn that uh, we're not going to renew the contract with them. And they were also very surprised to learn that the decision has been made six months before renewal date. So renewal date does not determine, is not necessarily equal to decision date. And for that reason, the model of pipeline management is not the right model. So what is the right model? What is the right model for customer success? So we talk about this. There are two things that are very difficult in customer success. Usually my joke is, in, you know, in these forums is, do you do planning for customer success and everyone feels embarrassed to say no, so they say yes. And when is your plan out of the window? Is it Monday, 11 a.m. or 12 p.m.? Because it's very, very difficult. Because the challenges in customer success are twofold. It's prioritization and focus. Focus, which of your customer needs your attention and why? And prioritization, where do we deploy our resources to make the, the best outcome? That's the question. And the model to support both of those is portfolio management. What companies that have been successfully, uh, that successfully transitioned into the customer success model have been able to understand is what they do is they actually run portfolio. They have their entire set of customers, and every customer is a different stage and a different, uh, uh, a different maturity level and they need to optimize their focus and their resources to maximize this portfolio. The other good thing about portfolio is that we can take the entire company's portfolio, look at the entire customer base as one portfolio, and break it down to sub-portfolios and assign those to customer success managers or pods of customer success managers, and it scales really well. Right? If it's a $100 million portfolio, you give uh, every CSM $2 million of this portfolio, and you have distribution of 50, 50 portfolios that roll up to the big portfolio. So how do they do it? So the first point, the first order of segmentation in a portfolio is to break down the portfolio into the customer stages. New customers, growing customers, in renewal customers, and customers at risk. Of course, new and uh, onboarding is where we focus. These are the drivers, and in renewal is transi uh, transient state, and in uh, um, at risk is also transit. We hope that we'll be able to recover them, but we're trying to make sure that most customers are not going to get there. And then we build an engagement model. Engagement model is the set of activities that are related to every stage. Onboarding, programs and success plays for onboarding, 
uh, nurturing programs and success plays for nurturing and, and so forth. And we carefully need to look and make sure that there is a program for every stage, especially the stages that are drivers. Because in many cases, and very, uh, many young uh, success organizations, their engagement program looks something like that. They realize that they need to do something post-sale so they onboard customers, and they have renewals and escalations, right? So all the, all the middle tier, the, uh, the, the activities that could drive, reduce, uh, maximize renewals, minimize escalation, and so forth are not being taken care of. So by, looking, by breaking the customer into this portfolio, it makes a lot of sense. And then the question becomes, how do we know that what we're doing is actually effective? And not just waiting for the renewal numbers and, uh, and uh, uh, retention numbers, because this is lagging, right? Renewal and retention is lagging. If we do annual contracts, we will know the outcome in 12 months from now, or six months from now, and so forth. So you have a set of metrics that are leading indicators that give you, uh, uh, that tell you if your performance of the engagement model, does it work? For example, in onboarding, it's time to value, adoption post onboarding, uh, customer satisfaction from the onboarding. Did we deliver of what we've promised? On the nurturing part where the customer is, uh, is growing, it's about adoption, uh, value customer is getting, utilization metrics, and so forth. And by looking at the metrics, we know where we're doing a good job and where we're not doing such a good job, so we can prioritize the work in order to maximize the outcome. And if you look at, that, look at this model very carefully, you'll see that it looks like a P&L, right? At the top, there are the things that we do that are driving the outcome. At the bottom, this is the result that is lagging six, nine, 12 months of those activities. And by looking at that, we are able to run our organization. So to summarize, the three points that I've noticed and I've documented in the book, the three points that companies that have successfully transformed into customer success learn to do really well is, one, they farm, they don't hunt. They are able to understand the recurring nature of the business and the recurring nature of the optimization that they're trying to do. The second thing is they run customer success as a business and not as a function of customer love. You know, the, the byproduct of that, that it also gives the leaders of customer success a seat at the table and resources and a voice to be heard. So running this like a business and looking at the metrics makes a lot of sense. And the last point is the operating model is of portfolio management and not support or project management or uh, pipeline management. And with that, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, feel free to get, uh, get the book. Uh, it's going to be on the counter, one of the counters over there, uh, outside. We've got amazing two days ahead of us. There's so much uh, to learn. I'm so excited. People are standing at the back. It's, it's, it's amazing. And one last point. My band and I are playing. You've seen the, the drums and guitars. So we're playing in the evening. So thank you all very much.